Here we are. Hey. Welcome to Wild Side Live. So tonight we've got a super special show. We're talking about zoonotics. We're talking about diseases that were transmitted from animals to humans. And we've got two incredibly special guests, and I'm very thankful that they're here. Uh, we've got Associate Professor of Wildlife and of Ecology and Conservation, University of Florida, uh, Dr. Samantha Wisely. Welcome, Dr. Sam. Hi, Michael. So good to be here. <clears throat> Sam, Dr. Sam, I'd just like to read this from your profile. Invasive species have the potential to create pathogen pollution, which facilitates the spillover of wildlife diseases into threatened and endangered species. This in turn can increase disease transmission at the interfaces of livestock and wildlife, not to mention uh, humans and wildlife. So I, I think that's really interesting uh, for tonight's show. And I'd also like to introduce uh, Joe Herman, uh, operator at Rocky Mountain Wildlife Solutions uh, from Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Uh, Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. Uh, enjoy being here. Uh, Joe is going to talk to us about his experience actually contracting the zoonotic disease. And I think it's very important that we listen to Joe's counsel. Uh, he's had a hard battle, and he's still going through it. And I think it's particularly important for people working in the wildlife field, uh, nuisance wildlife control operators specifically. And I think we're going to have some rehabbers and rescuers on this uh, presentation today as well. They need to be aware of these risks. So that said, let's get started. And I wanted to uh, wanted to bring in this video. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but this is uh, this is just bonkers. Uh, let's see if we can share this. And Dr. Sam, I'd like to get your reaction. Can you see the video? I can. Yeah. So a coyote is attacking this man's dog, and now the coyote is attacking him. So he picks a coyote up by the tail. And uh he's in the trash can. <laughs> but, oh my goodness. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to show something else because I think this is important. Uh, for us to take a look at. In the state of Florida, we've got the Department of Health in the state of Florida, and they publish this post-exposure guidance. And I think everyone should really take a look at this on the Florida Department of Health website. And I'm not sure how well you can see it, <clears throat> but pretty much... You know, it's a flowchart, and it's going to help us decide whether or not we need a post-exposure vaccine. And obviously, getting bitten by an animal uh, qualifies one as getting the shots. Dr. Sam, what do we think? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think... Uh, not only do they need to get their shots, but that needs to happen within 72 hours of that exposure. And frankly, it's not always easy to tra track down um, those post-exposure prophylaxis. Health departments are absolutely the place to start, your local county health department. Um, they should have it on tap, but um, unfortunately there's cases that happen every once in a while where people don't, don't quite know what's going on. Um, but in that case, that was a clear exposure. It was a wild carnivore that broke the skin. I mean, that is the most clear exposure you can have. Joe, I, would you like to bring in your story about uh, exposure? I think it would be 
important to hear. The the raccoon one? Yes. Um yeah, uh so I, I was relatively new to the business, um, two, three years into it and was working on a on a raccoon issue. Um it was a big raccoon year that year, um and was down to you know, the junk traps in the back of the pile. Um and of course the big male raccoon I was after got caught in the worst of the traps. Um and as I was walking the trap to the truck wearing, you know, my, my supposed bite proof gloves. Um, I, I looked down and the bottom of the cage had flexed and the raccoon was halfway out from under, halfway out from under the door of the cage and me being a, you know, young, dumb kid, like, well, I'll just grab him and put him back in the cage. And I, I, I reached down and, uh, raccoon got a hold of my ring finger and just so happened to get in between um the the slivers of kevlar that were in the fingertips and uh punctured the skin and you know when i felt it rip my hand out and the glove stayed in the raccoon's mouth and you know tore my finger apart and of course so here i got a raccoon in my left hand and my right hand's bleeding everywhere and the client pulls up, <laughs> um, you know, fortunately enough, the, you know, raccoon tested negative. Um, but I still went through, uh, the post exposure, um, and, and the vaccine and, you know, my, my insurance company, I, I have my in business insurance of Christian Baker. Uh, they were, they took care of the bulk of the bill, which was about 15 grand. Um, but I still had 5,000 out of pocket for everything else. So, um, yeah. And Joe, what was your experience uh, getting treatment, getting to treatment? Did the people that you approached, your doctor or the health department, did they know what to do? So when, when I got bit, I called Christian Baker right away. Um, they were actually the very first phone call I made. Um, and they said, uh, you know, get the raccoon somewhere where it can be tested and get your ass to the uh, emergency room. Um, so fortunately, I had a vet friend of mine that was just down the street. I took the raccoon there. He euthanized it, all that stuff. Um, and then I went straight to the hospital. Um, the hospital I went to um, had no freaking idea what they were doing. Um, wow. They had to Google everything. They had all the, you know, the immu, the him, what is it, hemoglobin or immunoglobin? Immunoglobulin. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, immunoglobulin. Yeah, that word. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they had all that stuff on hand, um, but they didn't know how to administer it. They had to Google wow. it. And the only reason I knew that is when they gave me all my um, uh, uh, paperwork when I was leaving the hospital. All the Google research they did was in my folder that they gave me. Interesting. So, you know, and then the health department for, you know, the vaccine and everything in Garfield County was absolutely wonderful. Um, it was quick. It was easy. Um, it, you know, they, they were ready for me when I got there. And, uh, you know, that aspect of it was, was absolutely amazing. Good. Well, I think it goes to show that those of us that are in the wildlife profession absolutely have to be our own health advocate. We have to know when we're exposed and, and tell our, our doctors when we think that has happened because they're not going to ask us, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, uh, and, you know, like in, in my part of the world, you know, Western Colorado, you know, the, the type of business we're in isn't a very well-known business. So a lot of doctors aren't expecting a patient to walk in and go, hey, I, you know, I was exposed to, you know, distemper or, you know, I think I got raccoon roundworm or I got sick from a damn pigeon or, or whatever. 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I honestly, I think that's everywhere. I really yeah. do. Yeah. So, Dr. Sim, what do we do? I mean, how do we, in these moments where we're not thinking clearly, how do we be our best own advocate? Well, I mean, we're all wildlife professionals. And so I think we have to know what the risks of our profession are, right? So I think educating yourself, knowing when you're in a risky situation, you know, being bit by a carnivore is a risky situation. And so knowing what to do. Um, I work with employees and students that handle unvaccinated carnivores. I make sure that they have the pre-exposure vaccination and anyone who works in the wildlife field should get their pre-exposure vaccinations. Um, but then when that happens, knowing that you need to go to a doctor, right? Knowing that if you've, if you've been exposed to, to some sort of feces and you start to feel ill, that you go immediately to the doctor and tell your doctor that you've been handling rodents or pigeons or carnivores, being very articulate about what you've been doing and being very specific about the species you've been handling. Understood. Uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we've been presented with here in my area, <clears throat> this uh, canine distemper virus seems to be prevalent in one of our large parks. <clears throat> so I'm just going to show what that is here. I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, I have to admit, Dr. Sam, this is something I don't understand, the canine distemper virus. Is this like rabies? Is this something else? Can Is this a zoonotic disease? Uh, what What do we know about this? Yeah, so, so canine distemper is a viral disease, as is rabies, but it's different. It's in a different family. Uh, it is it is not zoonotic, but it is highly contagious, particularly among canids and uh, and also raccoons. Um, and so um, it it does present itself in animals a bit like rabies does. So when you have something like a raccoon that's behaving like it has rabies and it tests negative, oftentimes that's because it's tested positive for canine distemper. <laughs> it's, it's a neurological disorder. It's a virus that attacks the neural cells. So they become very confused, um, which can be very much the same symptoms as rabies. Um, but it is highly contagious, and so it can be transmitted to unvaccinated dogs. Um, when we get our when we get our pets, and and every three years we get the that big vaccine that has a bunch of different things, the Dapville vaccine. Canine distemper is one of those vaccinations that in there. So that vaccination is not for life. Every, uh, your, you know, your veterinarian will tell you how often it has to be, but you have to get, your dog has to get re-vaccinated over and over because if they come into contact with um, an animal that has canine distemper, it more likely than not, they can become ill. And, and it's a very deadly virus for, for dogs and raccoons. So there's no transmission between the dogs and humans in this case? No, not that I'm aware of, no. Mm -mm. I, I run into uh, raccoons with distemper quite a bit. We, we had a, a, a distemper flare up just a few years ago and I mostly saw it in kit raccoons. Um, and one of the one of the symptoms that I noticed with the kit rack with the baby raccoons is they get a, their their eyeballs get bleached shut with this yellowy, crusty, crystallized type thing. Um, and and I use a dog in a lot of my stuff. Um, uh, and and she gets that that distemper vaccination as well. But um, yeah, I mean. It's it's out there, so and it'll decimate it'll decimate a raccoon population pretty fast. In my Absolutely, 
Absolutely, and it and it really uh, impacts coyote populations as well. Yeah, yeah. Foxes. Yep, that's absolutely true. Yeah. So, in addition to being a neurological disease, you're absolutely right. It can impact the lungs, the airways, the nose, and the eyes. So, Joe, do you handle this animal differently? I mean, is it obvious that you're dealing with distemper versus rabies? How do you approach uh, the situation? So, uh, you know, in, in, in the area that I'm working, we have not had a confirmed case of, uh, you know, rabies in a raccoon since the mid-80s. So, you know, in all reality, rabies is kind of the last thing on my mind, but distemper always is. Um, okay. Uh, you know, usually when I catch the female before I go in and remove the kits by hand, um, you know, I can usually get an idea that maybe there's something wrong just by how she's reacting in the in the cage. Um, but, you know, safety wise, you know, other than the respirator thing up until recently, um, it's always been handling handling them with gloves and you know, once you pick them up and you see those crusties around the eyes and, the and everything, then you know what you're dealing with. Um, and during that season, I, I, I work very closely with a rehabber. Um, and I usually take the kids and the female to her um, and she vaccinates them, gets them all cleaned up and taken care of. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is a recoverable disease, or once they're vaccinated, or not? In my experience, yes, um, because I've been part of part of the relocation, the re-relocation after you know the kids are healthy, the females healthy, and they're old enough to go go out back out in the wild. I you know uh, unless there's something I missed. <laughs> no, understood. I think it, it's it's really variable. There's different strains that are varying in lethality, absolutely. But I mean, it can be 50 to 75 percent lethal in populations. Yeah. Now, is that with <laughs> um, with treatments or out in the wild? Um, I, I think with treatments, it's probably slightly better, but, but, but treatments is really just supportive care, right? Trying to, yeah. to, to make them okay until their body actually fights off the infection. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to share, uh, another set of photographs here, if I can find this in my sharing. You know, we have a lot of variability in the way people approach nuisance wildlife control. And this is going to lead into Joe telling us his story. Um, and that is the way people in the industry protect themselves from exposure to these diseases. It looks like I'm not going to be able to... Uh, uh, here we go. Excuse me. Sorry, guys. Oh, well, yeah, we understand. So here we have an example of a nuisance wildlife control operator physically touching a dead rat without any kind of glove. And you can see he's got a scratch on his thumb. If you can see where my cursor is. I can. Probably so, from the same rat. <laughs> yeah, so, you, yeah, you wonder. <laughs> so we've got that example, but then, uh, yeah, not that example. But then we have this gentleman from Spark Wildlife Control, and he's got the full mask, the full gloves, you know, the respirator. So I think a little bit of knowledge is going to go a long way, and that is we need to fundamentally protect our skin. Uh, Dr. Sam, is that correct? Protect our skin, protect our airways, protect our eyes, protect your mouth. You know, what we don't want is droplets or um, any sort of um, 
infectious agent getting into our face or getting on our hands. And in some cases, even our clothing can be infectious and we need to make sure that we set it aside, wash it in hot water before we, we bring it back out. Absolutely, personal protective gear is the absolute best way to keep yourself from getting ill. So Joe, I think that's a good lead in to your story is, is we know Joe Herman is on the podcast today and he's a survivor of the zoonotic disease. So Joe, let's, uh, let's hear your story. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, back in June of last year, 2023, I was working on a small little pigeon project underneath, uh, uh, you know, on a covered patio, the pigeons were, landing on the beam work there and, and, and everything. Um, and I was up there in a big hurry, um, not thinking and cleaning the droppings up and then, you know, scraping the big chunks off and then using a antimicrobial cleaner, um, to finish breaking down those droppings and the bacterias and acids in the droppings. Um, so as I was scraping up the droppings, obviously I was in close proximity to it. I was breathing in that dust, that bacteria. Um, so I had already been infected with, you know, a bacteria from the droppings. Um, and when I sprayed the antimicrobial cleaner, a little gust of wind came up and I inhaled some of that cleaner. Um, and, you know, didn't think much of it at the time, went on about my day, finished the project, moved on. Um, a few days later, started feeling, feeling like, you know, crap and just kept working, just figured it was another chest cold or something. And the day I went into the hospital that morning, I was doing a small little raccoon seal up something that should have taken me a half hour 45 minutes um and finally got it done two and a half hours later uh came home and my girlfriend took me to the hospital um when i walked in there with saying i was having breathing issues and stuff they put their little finger oxygen oxy oximeter or whatever they call it on my finger uh, they didn't believe the number it read, so they went and got another machine. They didn't believe that number machine, and all three read that my oxygen level was down to 75%. Um, so I ended up staying in the hospital for five days um, on all kinds of medications and breathing treatments, and I couldn't... Uh, it, just to get out of the hospital bed and walk to the bathroom was a challenge. Um, and at the end of the five days, I was finally able to get up, walk around, you know, without getting winded. My oxygen level stayed good. Um, I came home, um, but I was on um, oxygen, had to have oxygen on 24, 24 hours a day. Um, and for for a couple of weeks and then um you know medications inhalers breathing treatments um and labor day i i was off the oxygen during the day i was just having to wear it at night um i i had a, a flare-up um the week before labor day weekend and i ended up back in the hospital for four days wow um yeah and at that time they uh uh took me down and they they performed a bronchoscopy on me took samples they cultured them uh came back that you know i i was sick from pigeons uh from the droppings um and since then since I got out that time, um, you know, I'm still on breathing treatments. I have to do four breathing treatments a day. Um, I have to carry a, a rechargeable portable nebulizer with me every day. I've got 
a home nebulizer machine that I have to use. Um, I got to carry two inhalers with me. One has a, a steroid in it for emergencies, and the other one is, um, you know, if I start feeling short of breath or anything, um, I can take that one and it kicks in within about a half an hour. Um, uh, you know, since I got out, I've had a few flare ups since then. I'm, I'm on my fifth round of steroids of prednisone to try and finish, you know, knocking this stuff out. Um, and, you know, I've been dealing with, I've been going through this since June of last year. So, um, and it, it wasn't worth it at all to save a couple minutes and save some comfort, save me some discomfort, wasn't worth it one bit. So. I'm sorry to hear about that. <laughs> yeah, that's rough, Joe. I mean, are you, I'm not even sure how to ask you this question, but, you know, it's pretty well documented that, you know, COVID just destroys people's lungs. I've got a friend who's a doctor, and she's saying that that's one of the leading reasons for lung transplants in young people yeah. today is COVID. I mean, how do you protect yourself, Joe? Uh, you know, um, since since that happened, I've um, you know I've gone and gotten a proper fit test done, um, and and gotten proper a proper respirator and everything and you know anytime i'm around doing an inspection or in an attic or crawl space or anything like that i'm you know i'd rather take the extra 10 or 15 minutes um and and protect myself now than you know have to go through something like this again um you know there's there's a lot worse diseases in our industry that that we can catch than this. Um, but if this is the worst I get, then, I, you know, I'll be thankful for it every day. So. Joe, can you provide people with some guidance on how they go and get a fit test? How, where do you go to do this? How do you find a respirator that is adequate or, or more than adequate for our line of work? So what, what I did is, is there's a, a company, I don't know if you guys have it out there called Fastenal. Um, yes. yep. I, I contacted my local Fastenal dealer um, I, because I know 3M comes around every now and then to those, to those types of companies and they will do fit tests there on site. Um, so I contacted one of them went through the fit test and then, you know, got, got my respirator then. Um, and I went with a full face, you know, double cartridge 3M respirator um, with the proper cartridges. I think they're uh, P100s is what we use in our, what we need to use in our line of work, I believe, if I remember correctly. Dr. Sam, have you heard of people being afflicted like this from bird droppings what what's your experience been yeah so i've actually had a um a colleague that that uh had a bird dropping a pigeon dropping uh splash in her eye um and she lost her eye because of it wow yeah so there are there are a number of pigeon specific diseases that are um zoonotic. Um, they can cause cryptococcosis, histoplasmosis, and acidococcus. So it's not just one, there's multiple that can um, impact people. So people need to be particularly cautious handling birds, particularly pigeons, but any birds with those droppings. And, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic of high pathogenic avian influenza. 
Um, so that's another one to be careful of as well. Uh, can you go in a little deeper on that? Why do we need to be concerned? Well, right now we haven't seen very many cases that have impacted people from, from birds. In fact, there's only been one. But avian influenza has the potential to become zoonotic kind of at the drop of a hat. Um, and so that is an influenza. So that's a, a respiratory disease, right? So um, anytime you're handling birds, um, you probably want to wear, at, at, at a minimum, if you're outdoors, probably an N95. And if you're in confined spaces, absolutely a, a, a well-fit respirator. So, Joe, how are you getting along now? How are you feeling? Uh, you know, um, it, with with the steroids, um, it, you know, it feels like I, I feel like I'm back to normal. Um, but, you know, uh, giving up and not doing the other other things, the the medications, the breathing treatments and things like that makes it, you know, a lot diff more difficult to recover once the round of steroids is done. Um, so, but other than that, I, I, you know, I'm doing a lot better. So that's, that's great to hear. Yeah. I wonder, yeah. I wonder if you're, are you having difficulties breathing through a mask? I mean, are, are you, are you trying to breathe harder because of your diminished lung capacity right now? Uh, you, yes. Um, I, I have noticed that, you know, uh, I, I have to move a little bit slower wearing the mask because you know obviously it takes <clears throat> excuse me um a lot more energy to breathe in and exhale going through those filters and then going through the 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 check valve on the way out so i have to keep myself from getting too winded to where i feel like you know i'm hyperventilating or, or suffocating um so it's it's definitely something that's been that's taken me a while to get used to and I still forget about it from time to time so I'll catch myself bebopping you know across the roof I I don't anymore I don't even mess around with the paper masks um uh even if I'm working outside you know doing a I don't know doing a, a solar panel exclusion project I'm still wearing that full face risk um uh so i have to you know keep reminding myself to slow down and not get moving too fast dr sam you know with these commensal animals uh out to kill us why uh i mean why are we feeding pigeons in the park uh, why why are we encouraging this human animal relationship with things that can put us down that's a really good question. And I think it's a difficult one, right? I mean, as humans, we we enjoy animals and we we get special um, interactions with them. I have three dogs, a cat and chickens, right? And, um, nice. and I enjoy them. Um, but I, I, I am not an advocate for um, creating nuisance wildlife or creating nuisance feral animals, right? So feral cats or um, nuisance pigeons. Uh, I, I think it really does create an increased zoonotic burden on us. And when we have our commensal animals that we love that are our pets that are part of our family, they need to be vaccinated. When they're vaccinated, they actually create a barrier between you and wildlife. And when they're not vaccinated, they create a conduit between you and wildlife diseases. Can we also agree that uh, the leash laws are there for a reason? Uh, you know, not letting yes. our cats run amok at night. Uh, what's your thought there? Yep. I absolutely think that animals should be safe and sound inside a kennel or inside the house. Absolutely. And and not feeding animals outside so that wildlife has access to that food. That's a phone call I get all the time. Huh? Raccoons are eating my cat food. They're 
skunks are eating like cat food and like just just quit feeding them outside they'll go away <laughs> that's exactly. really interesting because uh, you mentioned earlier that rabies is transmitted through saliva well if a raccoon is eating your pet's food aren't they thereby putting saliva into your pet's bowl yeah, they are. I mean, we tend to think that that rabies is a very fragile virus. And so we tend the dogma is that it needs to break skin, right? The saliva actually needs to enter your skin in order for it to be an exposure. But how long does it have to be exposed, right? If I mean, I've seen pictures of raccoons and cats feeding right next to each other in the same bowl, I've seen that, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, that I definitely would consider that an exposure, a potential exposure at the very least. We've got severe. Well, I don't know if severe. Severe might be an overreaction, but we have neighborhoods near where I live, and I think we mentioned this on the last time you were with us, Dr. Sam, that people were feeding peafowl. And you can just drive down the street and there are just peacocks and peahens just all over the place. And it's really an issue of providing an unnatural food source and the, the population has just grown incredibly. Yeah, and they're so destructive to property. Right, but, uh, you know, we have people that passionately love these animals. And from a nuisance wildlife control point of view, man, it's, it's sketchy getting involved with addressing these animals because people just go nuts. They go crazy. They call yeah. the police. They scream and yell. Uh, they call FWC. I mean, it's very few animal control operators here will even touch it. Yeah, I, I do not envy anyone trying to deal with that issue. People are very, very passionate about peafowl. Almost as passionate as they are about feral cats. <laughs> yeah. We, we did a uh, Osprey project a few years ago for a high school. Um, and the Ospreys had built a, built a nest on the stadium lights over the football field. And um, in the springtime when they were feeding chicks, you know, they don't land to feed, to, to drop trout, uh, to put trout in the nest. They slowly fly over the nest and drop it. Um, and sometimes they miss. And people in the crowd were getting smacked in the side of the face with, uh, you know, six, seven, eight inch trout. I, I'm going to stream it with you guys. I think it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> and everybody was complaining about this, right? So the school, uh, the school district decided to, you know, do something about the hospital. So we went in after the kids were old enough and they would fly off and they first for the year. We went in, removed the nest, put up deterrents and everything. And the outrage was unbelievable to the wow. point where um, our, our state wildlife officials were involved. Uh, the USDA Wildlife Services got involved. Uh, the whole nine yards. But these are the same people that were about getting stabbed in the side of the face by a trap with a trap. <laughs> it's, but it was, you know, we. I think we all run into those situations where we're we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. Um. So, uh, you know, very similar situation to your beef owl there or, or feral cats. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of feral cats here, and no, nobody except for some rescuers is dealing with it because the rules for handling these animals is so onerous. You know, it would take us all day, capture it, take it to the vet, bring it back, release it. Uh, you know, that's, that's a lot for somebody to do. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody trying to make a living doing animal control. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very intractable problem. It seems. 
not a very profitable one either. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's definitely a loss there. But I guess it's worse in Australia. You know, they've got a major issue with feral cats in the outback. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, in, in the United States, I, I forget the actual numbers, um, but feral cats are uh, responsible for, um, boy, I don't remember um, how many different, uh, causing mult a ton of different species of birds to go extinct. Um, and, and... It, it's funny you bring you bring that up at a customer and they don't care. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They really have decimated bird populations. Yeah. In the United States. Yeah. Yeah, I I see that a lot here with our coyote issues. There was a recent study that uh, showed that the urban coyotes' preferred meal is domestic cat so uh, you know people would rather have us kill the coyotes than bring the cat in at night and I just think the whole psychology of our relationship with animals is very strange it, it's so uh, you know we pick the winners and the losers but I don't think we even do that with full acknowledgement of what that means Absolutely. I think, you know, you look at the health and welfare of those feral cats and, you know, they have diseases, they're often starving, they live, they have a very short lifespan, you know, being a feral cat is not fun. It's not, it's not doing any, it, it, it increases suffering, right? right to have them there. For sure. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the the Denver uh, Boulder Fort Collins area of Colorado they uh, um, they they won't advocate for the killing of anything over there if if a coyote steals somebody's pet um, and and kills and eats it they want the coyote hazed away um, or relocated and. I, I remember a few years ago, I was at a wildlife commission meeting here in the state and they talked about how much money they spent um, hazing coyotes um, with zero effect. I mean, it was like five and a half million dollars and nothing, nothing came out of it. I mean, it, it's, it, it's it's crazy to me the mentality of um uh some uneducated uh people you know yeah i had a, a similar experience where a, a hoa wanted me to come and uh deal with a problem with these turkey vultures. Are you familiar with this turkey vulture here, Dr. Sam, that we have in Florida? We're really believe that their feces is incredibly toxic. In fact, these animals lived in a little island, on a little island in the middle of a pond, and the pond was completely dead because of the poisoning from the feces of these animals. And they, you know, basically it was a no-win situation. It's a protected animal. You know, you'd have to get all the right permits. And um, it just wasn't something that I was going to look at. It just wasn't a viable job. Yeah. USDA has done a fair bit of research on how to discourage. I mean, what, what you're describing is they communally roost. So it's not just one or two right. turkey vultures in that tree. It's hundreds yeah, right. of turkey vultures in that tree. And um, they've done some research to show that if you hang what they call an effigy right, the of a turkey vulture, which is a, a model of a turkey vulture upside down, and you hang that upside down in that communal roost, it will disperse them. Yeah, but you got to get up in that tree with 100 turkey vultures <laughs> crapping on you. And we talked about the risks of that. 
<laughs> yes. Yep. You know, the, the other thing that, that I've used in the past, Michael, for, for turkey vultures is, um, uh, have, have you heard of, uh, I can't, I can't pronounce the actual scientific word, but it's shortened up to an MA product. Um, it's, it's an inhalant, um, uh, essentially what it does is, is you run it through a fogger, a thermal fogger, and it just, it irritates the, the lungs, the respiratory system of the bird. Um, and early evening, right when they come to roost, right before dark, um, if you got no wind, you can fog, use the, use your fogger and fog this tree and they'll disperse that way and then you do it again in the morning um uh i've been very fortunate to you know in about a week to you know run turkey vultures off of roosting areas interesting to that. Hmm. So, this was in a this was in a densely populated neighborhood i i would be concerned about doing that here i, I what i looked at joe is a sound cannon but uh, there was really no effective way to safely mount the sound cannon. You know, particularly uh, didn't want to have to trek it back and forth and set it up every time. And I didn't want the neighborhood kids blowing each other apart with it. <laughs> <laughs> I I'd be one of those kids holding the lighter right out there at the end of the way for yep. thing to off. <laughs> 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 yeah, some jobs are better off just walking away from. Yeah, 100%. 100%. So Dr. Sam, what's what's new in in zoonotics? What what are you tracking? I I saw the herpes B comment on your uh webpage from UF uh regarding the monkeys and how you managed to get uh, the the uh, Florida Wildlife Commission to change their stance on, you know, how to react to these monkeys and treat them. Yeah, that's another tricky situation. Um, you know, there is a very strong contingent that loves those monkeys in Silver Spring State Park. And so getting rid of them um, is going to be very difficult. Right. Um, and so I think Florida Fish and Wildlife's commission take right now is to really just increase, decrease interactions between people and those monkeys because they become habituated to food very quickly and then they become super aggressive towards people. Right. Have you seen um, the videos in countries that, where they have monkeys? If you don't give that monkey that food, that bag, that banana, they're, they're coming for it. I've, I've seen videos of that in Silver Springs. What? Yeah, I don't yeah. Know so uh, and they do they carry a very deadly disease. I I mean, I, I unfortunately, I think it's going to take someone a, 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 a bad mishap like that, someone getting gravely ill before Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission will do something about it. Those monkeys have some very strong advocates that um, frankly, have terrorized people um, into not doing anything. Wow. Uh, yeah, Joe, we've got this population of uh, monkeys here in Florida that uh, they have this disease that's uh, herpes B, right, Dr. Sam? Correct, correct. And they're growing. That population is growing exponentially throughout Florida. Honestly, I think they're the next Burmese python of Florida. Really? They, um, they are spreading throughout central Florida. Wow, that's bad. So is this like a, a invasive species of monkey? Or so somebody brought some monkeys over, turned them loose, and now it's just kind of gone ape shit? <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Bad, no, bad that joke. is a very apt description. Bad, bad joke. <laughs> huh. Well, that, uh, that, that sounds like a ton of fun. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, I, I don't envy Fish and Wildlife Commission. They're in a very tough position. Right. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. You also mentioned something on your website about uh, policies regarding uh, feral hogs, wild boar, call them what you will, and how some of the policies regarding hunting those animals is actually contributing to the spread of zoonotics. Can you go into that at all? So I think what I'm what you're referring to is a study that we did a while back. It's actually not a zoonotic disease. It's a disease called pseudo rabies virus. Okay. It's not rabies. Um, it acts like rabies, but it's actually a herpes virus. Um, it doesn't make pigs very sick, but it kills Florida panthers. Right. And in fact, it's the third leading cause of death in Florida panthers. And it's this kind of this conundrum because pigs are the main diet of Florida panthers. So, so Florida panthers eat a lot of pig. And so Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, you know, wanting to promote panthers in some places really also then promotes pigs. Pigs are also the number two game species in Florida behind uh, white-tailed deer. So, I mean, there's a real economic incentive to keep wild pigs on the landscape. So you can see there, there's this sort of balance. Um, we're also right on the cusp of perhaps being part of the African swine fever epidemic, which will shut down the pork industry in the United States if it comes to Florida and starts circulating in those wild pigs. So I, I think in the near future, there's going to be some really tough decisions about wild pigs that are going to have to be made about their management. Absolutely. And what is this, the swine flu? What, what did you say about? Uh... African swine fever. It's a hemorrhagic fever that they get. Um, it ha has been circulating globally in Europe. It's absolutely decimating the pork industry, but also European wild boar are a native species there, and um, it's really decimated those populations as well. Um, it, it was uh, discovered in the Caribbean, um, in the Dominican Republic in 2020. Uh, and so people are, and that was the first time it had been seen in the Western Hemisphere since like the 70s. And so people are very concerned that it will get transported to Florida and then get into the wild pig populations. Here. How would it get transported, Dr. Sam? Well, you know, that's a good question. So, well, okay, so African swine fever has this very interesting transmission ecology. I mean, it's, it's a tough virus. So pork products, it cured pork products can actually have the live virus in it. So somebody brings a sausage from the Dominican Republic into the US. We also know that people transport live animals in boats um, and land illegally all the time in Florida. I mean, that's one of the hypotheses for how screwworm got here a number of years back. So um, I think there's a, there's a bunch of different scenarios by which African swine fever could make its way into Florida for sure. And is that a risk to us? Is that a zoonotic disease? It is not a zoonotic disease. It's an economic risk because of the pork industry. Oh. Yeah, Joe? Well, uh, I just, nothing. I Just great information. This is unreal. Yeah, it's unbelievable, right? Uh, Dr. Sim, the other question I had for you, you do mention invasives on your website. What What's the latest uh, besides the monkeys? I know we're talking about pythons decimating uh, the native mammal populations throughout the Everglades, but now we're finding other snakes. Uh, we're finding the snakes are going further north. You know, what, what are the zoonotic issues that we're facing here? Yeah, so... Um... I don't know about the zoonotic aspect, but I know USDA and others are very concerned about tegus, which are yeah. a, a monitor lizard, yes. and they're voracious killers, yeah. right? They they eat eggs of just about anything. I think they pose a real danger to our gopher tortoise Absolutely. population, all the species that live in gopher tortoise burrows. 
Um, so I know people worry about that. In terms of zoonotic diseases, you know, armadillos are kind of on the fence about whether they're invasive or not. You know, they, they, they disperse naturally into Florida, but they haven't been here all that long. But um, the Florida Department of Health has seen a real uptick in cases of leprosy, which is uh, carried by, can be carried by um, armadillos. And, and so they're wondering if there's increasing armadillo populations and then increasing transmission of, of leprosy. Some of the latest cases that people have seen, people haven't handled armadillos, but they might be very avid gardeners. Right. And so they're digging around in the dirt and maybe there's a, a fecal transmission that's happening there. So we don't we don't know we're we're very much sort of in the investigative stage. Um, there there's a lot of unknowns. So we don't we don't know how that pathogen gets into humans. Well, I mean, it's definitely a skin contact. It's a it is a pathogen that infects the ep, the epithelial tissues, so your skin tissue. So it is by touching it. But I, we think that there might be another transmission component if people are getting getting it and not touching armadillos, but touching things that armadillos might have touched, right? Like in gardening and things like that. You know, you mentioned the tegu, and you also mentioned on your website, you know, illegal trade of exotic animals. Clearly, that's an issue with these uh, invasive lizards. Uh, you know, we've got, I don't see it as much anymore because I think somebody's doing something about it. But on a lot of the Facebook groups regarding invasives, you do see people hinting at how they would like to buy these animals, which is clearly illegal. Yeah, there's a multi-million, perhaps billion dollar trade in exotic reptiles. Not all of it is illegal. People can have permits to sell and buy and and have these animals what's illegal is releasing them into the wild right right and that's how we got burmese pythons in the everglades that's how we got cane toads that's how we've got tegus so there's there is innumerable reptiles that are and amphibians roaming around florida right now because people released their pets because they got too big or didn't want them anymore or moved Yes, I had my first experience with t cane toads a few months ago. I went to do a survey. Uh, this very wealthy community has cane toads living around a pond. That's one of the biggest toads I've ever seen. They're enormous. And it They're absolutely enormous. It was barking at me like a dog. It was insane. <laughs> I mean, this thing was nuts. I had it in the back of the car. I was obviously had to euthanize it, but it was still in my bucket. And I swear it was opening the lid to the bucket. I had to pull the car over before this thing escaped. It was nuts. Are, are yeah. uh, iguanas still a big issue down there in Florida? Oh, yes. Iguanas are a big issue. Um, not sure we're ever going to solve that problem. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. There are so many, there are a number of invasive species whose numbers are so great now that we don't even talk about eradication anymore. It's that way with wild pigs. We'll never eradicate them from Florida. There's more than a million of them in Florida. Oh what we talk about is controlling them, right? Getting them out of sensitive areas where they can have big impacts on other species. Gotcha. And I think from a nuisance wildlife control, one of the problems that, that I see firsthand is an HOA, for example, will call and they want these pigs addressed, but they don't realize how expensive that work is. I mean, you have to do a lot. You have to have special traps. You have to set everything up. I mean, this is not catching a mouse in your attic. This is a big, big effort. And and then you have to dispose of multiple 300-pound animals. Right. Yeah, it is, it, it is a huge deal. Yeah, and generally... You know, even with the cane toads, it wasn't a lot of money. But, you know, uh, people just don't recognize the risks and they don't want to. Same with coyotes. They just don't want to pay to have anything done. 
And I think this obviously leads to the problem of these uh, invasive animals uh, increasing in population. Absolutely. So what are we watching out for in the coming year? What is 2024 going to do for us in terms of zoonotic disease, Dr. Sam? Oh, my goodness. My crystal ball. Um, Don't scare the well, crap out of me now. <laughs> I'm, getting a, I'm getting a mask. You have me convinced of that. So. Good. Good, good, good. You absolutely should. Well, I mean, I, I think armadillos and Hansen's disease, which is what leprosy is called, is, is definitely it's on Florida Department of Health's radar. They've seen an increase in number of cases that um, they actually had um, a big workshop trying to figure out what's going on. So I think we're going to hear a bit more about that um, in 2024. Interesting. I've had a number of armadillo jobs in the area. Uh, they can be big, big yeah, and heavy. And there can be a lot of them in a very small area mm -hmm. as well. They can be quite dense. Yeah. So wear your PPE when you handle them. So what PPE should we wear when we're handling these animals? I think gloves are sufficient. Okay. I really do. I think that's fine. I mean, you're not working in a confined space if you are a respirator for sure, but typically you're trapping them outdoors. Right. So, so you definitely want to wear gloves, making sure that you're not coming into contact. And then any surface that comes into contact with those armadillos, you definitely want to disinfect. I will say that the armadillo is, from a homeowner's point of view, a very destructive animal because they tend to burrow under the structure, under a pool deck, under a foundation. And that can be a very expensive thing to fix. Mm. Marmots, marmots are our armadillo here in Colorado. Really? Oh yeah, they burrow under um, uh, electrical boxes, um, foundations. Uh, uh, we remove them out of people's uh, the engine compartments of people's vehicles all the time. So yeah, they're they're bad. They'll get in there. They'll chew wires and. There's been a few cases of house fires because of marmots chewing on house wires and and whatnot. So yeah, it's this animal look like a groundhog? Is that what a same, marmot looks like? Same animal, same oh, critter. It's, same okay. critter, just you know has fifty hundred fifty thousand different names. <laughs> whistle pig, <laughs> rock chuck, uh, you know. Ah, the whistle pig. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's about it for us tonight. Uh, Joe Herman, Dr. Sam Wisely, thank you so much for coming on. This was incredibly educational. And Joe, you know, we're really wishing you an ongoing recovery. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. yeah, so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll be on again soon. Have a good night, guys. Bye.